uh, generously sponsored by PBS SoCal. So we do have plenty of tea available, totally free because of PBS SoCal, and also homemade cookies. So feel free to help yourself. Don't be shy about getting up for refills. Um, so today's topic is going to be artists that teach. And there is this kind of saying that those that can't do teach. And I completely disagree with that because every teacher I've ever had has been so generous and so good at what they do. And I think that statement is kind of anti-intellectual and kind of anti-learning. And so um, today we're going to learn about teachers that do. So if you'll take it away, Greg, introduce yourself. Hi, uh, my name's Greg LaRock. Um, this is my 13th year here at the festival. Uh, I am, uh, as far as teaching, uh, I'm the landscape instructor at LCAD. I've been doing that for the last couple of years. Uh, I also have taught uh, like plein air workshops, landscape workshops. I've taught all over the country for the last dozen years uh, and also hometown workshops as well. So I'm honored to be here and happy to share all my things with you. And what Elizabeth said is true. I don't think uh, artists who teach just only teach because they can't do what they do. So they're all, look around this, this incredible place here. Lots of people teach, and they're all fantastic artists. So. Hi, I'm, I'm Jeff Rovner, and like all of us, I'm a bunch of things. Um, I'm a longtime Laguna Beach resident, living with my wife, uh, Marie, and my daughter a few blocks away. Uh, I'm also a, um, a lawyer and the head of technology for the law firm on Melvin and Myers. Um, and third, I'm a photographer exhibiting for my third year here at the festival. This year, uh, I have a kind of a crazy uh, exhibit that uh, looks something like this, uh, where I have photographs, gigantic photographs, of six vintage toys, each representing a different category of artificial intelligence, and each covered by a piece of plexiglass that is etched with the actual code from an application of AI in that category. So for example, this uh, Zoltan fellow that you might recognize from the movie Big, um, stands for the category of prediction. So when Amazon predicts what you want to buy, and uh, Pandora predicts what song you want to listen to, they're using that category of AI. Uh, I am also a teacher, but I'll, I'll save that for the next one. Hi, I'm Dennis Denton, and I am a professor of black and white photography. I don't have anything like Jeff. I just have black and white photography, but I taught for at a high school for 30 years, and I've been in this show for 20 years now. And I now have uh, students come in not only with their children but their grandchildren to say hi, which always makes you feel really old. Um, I the transition from uh, teaching photography, which is what I mainly did as a teacher, to this was really seamless. It's uh, it's kind of surprising how easy it was to take the knowledge that I had built up in my teaching years and kept, kind of apply it to the discipline to become an artist. I never knew that I could do this when I first started. I didn't go to art school. I, actually, I only took one photo class in my whole life. So I'm kind of self-taught. And you come into a situation like this where many of the people in show have a lot of credentials that go beyond anything I did. And yet, the drive was always there to do it. And I found that by coming here and being part of this company of great artists in the show, it actually kind of, I had to get my game a little higher. I, mean, I had to rev up a little bit, and it's worked out pretty well. So we'll talk about that a little bit more. But again, the transition between the two, they kind of go hand in hand as far as I'm concerned. Hi, my name is Vinita Vogue. I'm an artist at the festival. I'm a 18 year exhibitor here at the festival. Um, I am the opposite experience than Dennis. Uh, I always was an artist. I believe my mom says I was six years old and I announced to the whole family that I was going to be an artist. Um, so I was an artist first and then uh, I've been teaching at the college level for the last 15 years. So I taught at Saddleback College and currently I'm teaching at Golden West College in Huntington Beach and I've truly, truly love teaching, uh, which I didn't know about myself till it fell in my lap. And uh, I think um, 
I am very enriched by my teaching experience, the students, I really love that. I did not know that I knew so much uh, about my medium, and I did not realize that I would really, really enjoy teaching as much as I do. And then I'm Elizabeth McGee, I'm also an exhibitor here, and then I've only started teaching probably in the last like five or six years, and um, I had a lot of teachers who were really influential to me, but I've mostly been teaching one-on-one, -on -one, so someone goes, hey, how do you paint that? And it's like, I'll, I'll show you, you know? So I do that, and then I also teach uh, through LOCA uh, Community Arts, and so teach at the youth shelter and at Glenwood House, and I've, I've really enjoyed that, and I found that the questions the students give actually makes me kind of think more about what I do. Um, so that's the kind of teaching I do, and then maybe we'll go into more specifics down the line on uh, do you teach at an institution or privately? And What's the question? The question <laughs> is, what sort of teaching do you do? Uh, well, I do both. Um, in, you know, at the institution at LCAD, that's relatively new for me, uh, teaching the landscape class there, because now I'm teaching um, basically kids, you know, uh, college kids, which is a whole different uh, focus of, of attention than <laughs> when you're teaching uh, adults that I've done privately for a long time. So I've been on both the, uh, the private level, I've done one-on-one, -on -one, I've done you know, small classrooms, and then the larger like, uh, classrooms like the, at, that LCAP has. Um, I think the, uh, there's no real difference to me between it. Uh, I, I, I really enjoy what I do, I, I, love, to, I love to teach. I think that's a big influence just because of as you grow as an artist, as you learn when you're young, there's always one or two teachers that really just just turn the light bulb on for you or point you in the right direction. And when you realize that and you see that, that's when you go like, wow, those were the moments when I really learned something, when I really got some good information to go and, and make my work better. And you, you realize that those people were very instrumental and that I want to maybe be that person. I was so thankful for those moments as a student that if I could turn around and give those moments back to now uh, the students that I'm instructing, that's hugely enjoyable and that's really, that's the whole reason for teaching. I think anyone would say that's um, a high, whatever, reason to teach uh, is what, what, it, what you can give what you learned along your path, and also uh, what also comes back to you. you. You you get much back as an instructor. So, um, I think the yeah. So, like, are you teaching more like uh, oil painting? Or... Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, no. I, I do landscapes. Uh, I teach in oils. I don't really require that people paint in oils because most of my concepts are not necessarily. You know, we mix this paint with that paint, and you know, it has to be done a certain way. I try to teach more conceptually you know, composition, design, you know, uh, how to make a painting, or how to make painting a better, how to make a, 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 what you see into a work of art. That's really what I'm looking for. What are the, what are the tools that go into that? So I try to teach that more than a te technique of some kind or a specific medium when I teach. But basically, I, I'm focusing mainly on landscapes, uh, and I do, do work in oils as well. Um, I'm kind of an odd duck on this panel because my teaching has nothing to do with art. Um, for the past 10 years, I've been a professor at George Washington University back in D.C., uh, teaching in part of a master's program in law firm management, uh, where my curriculum includes information technology, knowledge management, cybersecurity, and artificial intelligence. And as you can imagine, um, D.C. is a heck of a commute from Laguna Beach. So, uh, I, have a, I have kind of a special arrangement where I teach my entire class in three days, 20, 24 hours of instruction in three days, which kind of violates the Geneva Convention on both sides um, at the lectern, you know. But, um, but I have very indulgent uh, students. And I have taught one class uh, at UCI Law, and I enjoyed that very much, and I'm looking forward to doing more of that. Um, it's a great school and much easier to you. Well, um, when I was hired to teach at El Toro High School, uh, which is, now it's definitely forest now, but uh, this was the school's first year, so actually we didn't even have, we had no, I didn't know where to begin, honestly. I had to talk to the architect and 
take a look at the designs and see if I thought what they were doing would work for what I wanted to do in that class. I had to put together a list of the supplies and equipment I thought I'd need there and hoped I was guessing right. And uh, basically, the first year was a lot of fumbling around. We only had juniors. We had the freshman, sophomore, junior class. We didn't have a senior class. We had double session admission via to a high school where our school was being built. And I had to constantly go over to the site and just see if it felt right. I didn't know. And I talked to a lot of other photographers and got input on that, and that was helpful. But you wind up, you know, you don't know. Um, I started teaching it. I realized that the advanced class, I really wasn't as prepared for as I was for the beginning. The beginning class is a lot of nuts and bolts, f-stops and shutter speeds and stuff like that. But then they come back for a second year, and he's on now one, you know. And so I had gone to a, I saw Ansel Adams work at Orange Coast College. And I, at that time, I never heard of him who he was, and I was taking photographs with a 35 millimeter camera, shooting color, and I getting my work out there to a few other places, and I came to realize that I, suddenly there's a paradigm shift in the way I thought about photography and looking at the work that he was producing in black and white, and how elegant it was, and how it was just so beautiful, so impressive, that it kind of turned me around, and I went out and kind of looked at the classroom, oh, there's no camera here that I can use, he used what was called, or what is called a view camera, which is a large format camera, it doesn't take roll film, it takes sheet film. We didn't have one. So I started looking through the penny saver and I actually found this one for sale for $300. It came with four lenses and a big carrying case. It was a studio, had a big rail on it. It was really a studio camera. But it came with everything, film holders. So I bought it for me to learn how to do this so I could turn around and teach it. I was talking about this with Jeff earlier. And the funny thing is that when I took it out initially, it was really a tool. I was going to learn how to do this so I could provide lesson planning for advanced kids. But I like fell in love with it. So all of a sudden, it was all I wanted to do. I mean, I set my 35 millimeter camera down, and I, I still shot with it, but I left it. I never gone back. I still do. The work I do is based on that 4x5 knowledge, that Ansel Adams zone system. And a lot of things came out of me learning how to use that camera. And I'd bring my camera in and just leave it in the class so the kids could use it because it opened things up for them that I would I didn't even realize I wanted to do it until I did it. So that's part of the SK thing. You learn by doing, and I think a lot of that is helpful has helped me throughout my career as a teacher and somewhat as my career as a fine art photographer here at the So I um, start, I teach uh, four levels of printmaking at Golden West College. So it's printmaking one, two, three, and four. And a student that is very interested in printmaking can be, uh, stay with me for two full years, develop their portfolio, and then transfer out to a four-year school. And that's the goal of the community colleges to transfer the students out to four years uh, colleges, uh, universities. And so that helps to have the student with me for uh, the more serious students for two, uh, for uh, four semesters. And uh, when I started teaching at Golden West College, uh, they only had printmaking one. And the instructor before me had taught printmaking one for 30 years over and over again. And uh, if the goal for the school was to transfer these students out, uh, they, we really needed to have printmaking two, three, and four. So I wrote curriculum for printmaking two, three, and four, uh, had it passed through the board and through the um, uh, state of California, the powers that be. And so the classes kept getting added every semester. So uh, it's really fabulous. And then a few years ago, about five years ago, I added a class for professional artists to take printmaking. And so once a week I teach professional artists um, with printmaking. They could be painters, sculptors that want to learn printmaking, or they could already be printmaking artists that want to push their, um, or go to the next level with, with the medium. So I'm kind of like, you know, edge them on. So it's kind of, it, it's uh, the Wednesday, class, excuse me, I always say they, they really, um, are, it's very taxing because they're all on their own project and they want more of, from the instructor. And um, I tell them I don't drink alcohol, but if I was a drinking woman, I'd go home every Wednesday night and open a bottle of wine because <laughs> I feel like I, I need something at the end of the day. So I find it to be a very uh, rewarding profession. It's a giving profession. And I now totally understand why instructors and professors take sabbaticals. Uh, you need that time off from teaching. As much as you love your students, you need some time off to yourself. 
Yeah, I, I've only been doing one-on-one -on -one teaching for painting, and it's like the same thing where I, I give 100% to my students, and it's like I've been hesitant to even think about going into a classroom full because it's like I'm being kind of selfish because I want to spend my time on my art too. And it's like, okay, I take on four or five students, you know, at any given time, and then I can give my all on those days that I'm teaching. But otherwise, it's like I'm selfish and just going to work on my work because uh, – I, I teach uh, in the old atelier style, so it's almost like where you would have an apprentice. So you start someone off from the very beginning, and this is how you mix the paint. These are all the tools, and so it's almost it's very technique based until they get to the point. Like I have a couple students who've been studying with me for a few years, and so then that's when we start going into the abstract concepts. What are they interested in? So. I'll probably learn a lot from you guys from all your experience, so thank you. <laughs> um, and then, uh, how did you get into teaching? Uh, for me, teaching started, um, well, I had a big high, uh, my background was all uh, drawing and painting in college and things, but out of college, I go, I'm not going to make it as a painter, so I went into graphics. I did graphics, I was already doing graphics to put myself through college, so that was my sort of career at the time, so I wasn't painting much. And then when I finally decided to get back into painting, I talked to my wife and I was going to do it as a hobby. Uh, I was just going to be for fun because I was sort of between hobbies at the time. So I, uh, I started doing that. And it's sort of one thing led to another. And then I started selling work. And I kind of had this very fast, at least it seemed very fast, progression of going from kind of just brushing the rust off and almost not knowing what I'm doing to being able to get into galleries and shows and, and selling work and doing these things. And I thought, you know, wow, that was a, you know, kind of a blessing to some degree that I kind of made these leaps and bounds rather quickly comparatively to others, even though it really wasn't that way. I had a whole educational background in it, but it seemed that, you know, I was making these leaps and bounds. So I thought originally as a, um, as just sort of a let's give back kind of a thing, I should turn around and teach everything I knew. All the things that I had done to get this far and the techniques or whatever I had learned, thought, well, it'd be nice to turn around and pass that on to help other people move forward as well. Because I love to watch people grow and their work you know, getting better. It's so rewarding. Uh, so that's how I started. And, um, and you know, you just kind of go from there. It's, it's, uh, it's just a wonderful experience. Uh, I completely fell into teaching. Um, the, the person who created the program at George Washington was named Carl Leonard. And Carl and I had practiced law together at a firm for many years. And when, um, when I quit the practice through technology, he kind of followed my career from the sidelines. And when he created this, this master's program and needed a section on technology, I was naturally the, the one that came to mind. So, complete uh, happenstance and pick up the phone you know, at, the, at the right time. Well, uh, I kind of fell into teaching also. Uh, back in the 60s, uh, when I was going to high school and college, I initially was involved with technical education, industrial arts. My, both my father and my brother worked in aerospace, and that looked good to me. And then so I thought, well, I'll prepare for that. So I went to junior college, and I was taking classes. I took these two 15-unit classes that were, you know, huge classes, many hours a week, and it was all for prepping to get out of junior college and go straight into teaching. But then I changed. I mean, the um, Vietnam War was going on, and I became involved in the political elements that were there then, and I kind of turned away from what I was going to do, and I started thinking about a different way to go. And also, to be honest with you, when I decided that I was going to go ahead and get a degree and leave the AA degree behind, I wanted to get a BA degree, I thought maybe I'll just change the direction here of my life because I really didn't want to work in aerospace. I didn't work. I didn't want to work in an industry that was basically affiliated with war. And so I started looking at other opportunities. And the thought came to me: Well, I'm going to go for a BA, and so I'm going to just expand what I know, and maybe I can find something else that will work. And also, back then, uh, during the Vietnam War, you got what were called two S deferments. If you were actively enrolled in college, then you were no matter what else you were. That was okay for that semester. You had to keep getting them. But as long as you were actively enrolled, you weren't going to be drafted. And there was a point in time when I had went through kind of a hippie phase that, you know, a lot of my friends were considering leaving the country to avoid the Vietnam War. And I basically just said, I'm going to go to college. And I did, and I got my degree. 
And then I decided that I was going to take a look at teaching. I talked to a few professors there, and they said I might be able to enjoy that. It's something that might work for me. And I set in on a few classes. And so I decided to do that. So I went ahead and got my standard secondary teaching credential. And I went through student teaching. And I enjoyed it. I found that I liked it. But I didn't know going in. And, and quite, quite honestly, I didn't know what it was going to be like. And then I got into the classroom. And I really enjoyed it. It was like fun. It was a lot of fun interacting with the kids, having them come up asking questions that I could answer, you know, occasionally. It was fun to do that. It was fun to hear that, to see that interaction with the kids and to try to help them along. And so, in a way, like Jeff, I just got kind of drawn in. You never know what your path is going to be. At least I didn't know what it was going to be. And I wound up being teaching this class for 30 years. It was one of the best career decisions in my life, and I really didn't make it. I just landed there, you know, and it worked out for me. And you just never know. Put it close down, you just never know. I got into teaching, um, it just fell in my lap by accident. Um, I was born and raised in India and in New Delhi, and I met and married my American Dutch husband. Uh, I met him in India, we moved to California, and I'd been an artist about, you know, 20, 25 years. And, uh, I was studying a lot of printmaking here in the U.S. Uh, I didn't have enough classes in my art school in India and printmaking. was always drawn to it. Uh, but I already had my BFA and MFA before I moved here. And um, I started taking more printmaking classes at UCI, which was being taught by a very famous uh, American printmaker. Uh, it was like uh, studying painting from Picasso. Uh, it was really a well-known, and I accidentally was in his class. I really learned a lot from him. And then I had my family, and once the kids got a little bit older, I was itching to do more art and enrolled at Saddleback College just to use the press, uh, which I didn't have, an etching press. And so, uh, lo and behold, I got lucky again, met the teacher of the century. Uh, he was, it was a man born to teach, as you know, we were talking about who our favorite teachers were, were, and he was going, after a few years of learning printmaking with him, uh, he was going on sabbatical and asked me to teach his class, and, you know, I'm standing there thinking very quick on my feet, like, I can't say no to Bill, his name is Bill Riley, can't say no to Bill, so I'll teach a class, his class, for one semester, no problem, I can do it, you know. I know the material, uh, I have the degree, but I don't know how much I like teaching. Well, first day, into the first 10 minutes of the first class, it was the best time of my life. And I was shocked to learn myself that I knew so much because once each student was starting with their projects, they always had a different question, and I knew the answer to everything. I was shocked. Uh, I had practiced so much in my studio personally that I had learned a lot and collected a lot of information and knowledge and it was such a pleasure to just pass it down and to teach the next generation. So it's been, that was 2004 and I'm still teaching and really loving it. Yeah, I started uh, teaching one-on-one -on -one just because people were asking me, how do you do that? And then also tutoring students at LCAD, like who needed help with perspective. And uh, they always say left brain, right brain. And I tend to be more analytical, even though I am an artist. And so uh, I tend to teach it that way. And I love teaching at the local youth shelter through LOCA because I love being able to, even though it's an only an hour long class and I may only see these kids once, to be able to teach them how to do something where they can be proud and be like, I made that. I learned how to do that. So that when they go home, it's like, yeah, I can do this, you know? And so I think in, in a way, even just teaching a skill is very empowering. And I think art is so mysterious to a lot of people. It's like you either have it or you don't have it. And I think that we all have a unique voice, but that if someone wants to learn a skill, it's like, no, you can learn that. Like, I believe in aptitude over talent. Like I didn't have an aptitude for art, so I had to study really, really hard to even get to the same place as a lot of my other classmates. Um, but it's, for me, teaching art is, I like to compare it to like teaching math. Like I don't have an aptitude for math, 
I actually took a test for, for community college where they're going to place you in a math class. And it's like, ooh, I'm going to need four years of remedial math. <laughs> so it's like, but if I worked really hard, I'd be capable of learning calculus. I don't think a math teacher would be as willing to go, oh, you know what, just don't even bother with math. So um, I think taking the mystery out of, of art has been a joy to be able to help students who are struggling to, to clarify. Um, and then uh, what, who are some or one of the teachers who inspired you the most in your, and kind of influences how you teach now? Well, I think uh, uh, probably have to be my high school teacher because that's the one who sort of pointed me in the direction from the get-go. Uh, I always drew as a kid. I was always art-oriented, even though I didn't know I was. That's just what I did, and I enjoyed that pastime. And when I got to high school, I was sort of, since I drew all the time, I was ahead of all the other kids just by you know, default or so. Uh, so. And then he recognized that skill in me, and I was sort of, you know, I... He's like, okay, you got something here. I'm going to take you kind of under my wing, and we're going to do this and this and this and make sure, you know, he would get me, push me a little farther than what the other kids were doing. And I think that was a big influence because that showed me that, oh, well, you know, because I was a terrible student in everything else, like I said, like math. Oh, my God. You know, that was my, so my senior year in college was advanced life painting and remedial math. Those are my last two classes I took. So I put math off to the very end. <laughs> Hate doing that, but I, you know, so that, you know, he, it showed me that, oh wow, you know, you're you're good at this, you can do this. This is something that you, you know, uh, and sort of pushed me in that direction. And that was highly influential and really sort of opened my eyes to a whole new world that I never thought I would ever really go into. Really didn't know what I was going to do growing up, but it was always like, well, these are my strengths. This is what I do. Uh, I'm going to pursue this and to see where it leads me to go. And I think that those, um, so he was the, really the big influence on. And then it's really sort of as you go through your learning and, you're, and you, you, either you're in school or you take workshops or you, whatever you do, there's always one or two people that you'll run into that just have a, either a knack for it or the people who really sort of open your eyes to new experiences or new things. And it's like, wow. And those instructors are the ones that, when they do that, it's not just like, well, there's all kinds of things that we do that everyone needs to learn, you need to learn all this, these basic things. And then there's the one the instructors who can say, you know, for you, you need to do this. And then you go, oh my God, that's exactly what I need to do. How did he know that? And that, those moments, when you get that information and you realize, boy, this, this person was so adept in seeing what I needed that those were the inspirers to turn around and do that myself. You know, that's what I want to do. I want to take the artists that come to me and I want to say, you don't want to, you know, you don't really want to paint like me. I want to make you better use. How do we do that? What do you like? What are you interested in? And turning that around and making that student go, you know, oh, you know, I like this, and so I try to add in this, this, and this, and keep them on their way. And you need to do this and take that direction. You've got the tools. You just need to do this and this, and you can get a lot better. So hopefully that's the giving back. Um, if you think about it, I've only had maybe a couple of moments as a student, like the one you're describing, and they do stick with you, and you never forget them. Uh, yeah, never, and, ever forget that. <laughs> but I think back on the... on generally on the teachers that meant the most to me, they were all characters. You know, they, they brought their whole selves to their, to their teaching job. So I had a, a photography uh, instructor who was also a stand-up comic. And um, two, two weeks in Burma with him was an unbelievably fun experience. Um, I had a physics instructor in high school who was kind of a, a beatnik and uh, drove a fancy sports car. And I had a mentor in, uh, in legal practice who had been a Secretary of State, Warren Christopher. And every one of these people um, made the, the class, or whatever the, the teaching was, far more interesting because they brought all of themselves to that job. So I tried to do the same thing in my class at, uh, in Washington, where rather than present myself formally to a new group of students each year, 
I bring all of the odd hobbies and interests that I have and try to uh, intermingle them into my curriculum. Because remember, it's eight hours a day for three days, and that's an awful lot of, you know, uh, of monotonous Jeff uh, to be listening to. So I, ever since I've been a kid, I've been doing magic tricks. Um, I'm a professional magician, so I bring my magic tricks and and anything possible to break up the, the 24 hours. You know. so. Next time you'll have to bring your magic tricks up here. <laughs> That's next time. I could echo what Jeff says. The people that you remember from education, I remember from education, were the ones that were characters. I had two, um, when I got to college, I had two majors. One was industrial arts, and the other one, was, my minor was history. I guess the two teachers in high school I had the most fun with, or I respect the most, was my high school drafting teacher, Mr. Hammer, and my uh, history teacher, Mrs. Frades. They couldn't be more different. Mr. Hammer <coughs> had a kind of a butch crew cut, you know, white Oxford shirt, bow tie, looked every day pristine, and he tolerated no BS at all. You were, you know, if you were out of line, you are out of the class. And so what I learned from him was discipline. You know, if he felt you weren't giving your best, if he felt you weren't trying, if he felt you weren't listening, he would come over and just stand over and give you this look, like you know, you know, and so all of a sudden you put your head back, you're looking up like this at him. And ultimately, what he did, he forced you to be your best because you didn't want to be embarrassed in front of class. He didn't really embarrass you in a bad way. He just stood over there and looked at you, read it. You're, like, you're not listening to me. Do it right, you know. And so, all right, so you start doing it right. And I found out that with that kind of leadership and power, I felt compelled to do a good job in that class. And ultimately, I became, yes, one of his best students. And uh, it made me think that, well, I could do this then in the future. I could go into college, I could go to business, I can do this job. And it was him that gave me that. He gave me that discipline and that drive to do it just with the way he carried himself. And if, he wasn't my type of guy, really. He wasn't the type of guy I hung around with. And like I said, ultimately, I kind of hippie look. He was anything but that. But he made a huge influence on me. And then the other teacher, Mrs. Frady's, couldn't be more opposite you know, politically and everything else, but she was so good at drawing you into her world. We were taking U.S. I was taking uh, world history with her, and so you would get these lessons on ancient Egypt or Samaria, which is what. Right? But she would paint a picture of what those cultures were like and draw you into her world as she knew it. And uh, you know, she was always saying, "Look around you, be aware of what's going on, because things change." Rosie, saying this, we are able to remember history, do repeat it. She does that a lot. They say, "Let's not make the same mistakes some of these cultures made. Let's try to be better." And then I tried to use that later on in life, too, and just the way I handled myself in life was try to be better. And I got that from her, and in such a different way of promoting it. But again, she was the, one of those teachers you just remember is getting very involved in the person teaching. You never thought she would be, but to this day, I still have a love for history. I watch history shows on TV. I read books on it. I find it a fascinating thing, and I think that a lot of it dates back to her. Um, I would say my first... Um uh, there have been teachers at every stage that I can remember that have uh, taught me so well. But my grandfather, uh, since I was uh, the age of three, I would go visit my maternal grandparents in another town and uh, for the entire summer. Although my grandfather was an engineer, he loved to draw. And uh, he would um, buy, he had bought these um, sketchbooks, paper, pencils, and so forth since I was uh, three. And I would sit in his lap and we would draw together for, you know, a, a lot over the two months uh, I would be in his town uh, with my grandparents. And I think that instilled in me the love for art. Uh, because my parents were certainly not artists. And uh, to, uh, till I was an exhibitor at the, at the show, my mom would come from India over the summer, and I'm not a painter. And she would say, oh, please come and see my daughter's paintings. And I would say, mom, they are not paintings. These are prints. These are, this is printmaking. She says, yes, yes, it's all the same. And um, anyway, so my parents were not uh, it was a family of attorneys and bankers and engineers, uh, but um, I was the sole artist in the entire family. <laughs> and um, we, um, I uh, think the other, uh, so my grandfather, I would say, certainly got me started, interested, and uh, uh, 
Fabulous, fabulous. So lucky to have great teachers, art teachers and other teachers, but especially I remember my art teacher in high school. I remember my art teacher from kindergarten. I remember my art teacher at UCI uh, and college uh, at the art schools. And I especially remember the art instructor uh, at Saddleback College. Um, and uh, I watched him for years, how his style of teaching and I really emulate that in class to get the best out of each student. Not all of these students in my class are going to be artists because we are in a community uh, college and they're going to go into law school. I have one student that's going to law school. Uh, I have nursing students. I have all of these English students. Some of them, two or three out of 30 will be printmakers, but the rest will have the best experience with printmaking in my class. So that is my goal. Yeah, my, I also, uh, my great grandma was an artist, and so she actually showed in this show in the 50s, but I didn't know that when I moved here, because I grew up in San Diego, and I knew she lived in Capo Beach, and uh, we would go visit her beach house, and she would, uh, she was in her 90s at the time, and she would take out her Windsor and Newton watercolors and her Arches watercolor paper, which is the best stuff, and set it out, and all us kids would just mess it up too much water, scrubbing the brushes, and her daughter, my grandma, will be like, mother, they're just wasting it. You know, just let them use the cheap kid stuff. And she's like, no, they need to have a feel of the good stuff, you know, because you wouldn't want to, like, handicap somebody with the wrong materials. And so I really appreciated that. I liked how my great grandma stood up to my grandma, you know. But, um, and then when I, I wasn't really particularly interested in art, my great grandma encouraged all of us to be artists as kids, but I kind of fell out of the face, thought I was going to be a writer, and then when I was a teenager, you know, I kind of got lost, kind of introverted, didn't care about anything, you know, that teenager attitude. So my grades totally slipped in middle school, and I was kind of failing on purpose, you know, it's like, I don't want to do this work. So um, I was in these remedial English classes, even though it was so easy, because then I could just do the homework really quick and then go back to doing what I actually wanted to do, which was reading books, you know, that weren't on this, the list. Um, and then I had a teacher, Miss Lyons, when I was in 10th grade, and I'd been going to summer school every year to make up for those failing classes so I could keep on moving to the next grade. And um, Miss Lyons was like, well, I know you can do this, and it's like, I'm still not going to do the work, I don't care. So she actually went to her superior, and it's at LAUSD in the public school, and uh, said that I should be in the Honors English program. And I was like, well, I'll show her, I'll feel that too, you know? So we, I show up, and I had not bought any of the supplies for the class. Like, for Honors, you have to have all your supplies and your special books and everything. And Yep, I didn't have nothing. I, was gonna, I thought I was going to get booted back to remedial right away. And she came by my desk and put down a folder, all the pencils, all the textbooks that I didn't buy, and just went on with the lesson like I had brought them in. And I felt so awful. <laughs> I felt so awful. She didn't single me out or anything, but it was just like, wow, she went and got these for me and didn't say anything about it. And I felt so guilty for being so selfish that from that minute on, I got straight A's in all my classes. That it was like just having a teacher who cared, you know, who would like go that extra mile. I know she could financially afford to do, the, do that for every student, but it was just like knowing that somebody cared when you're just like an apathetic teenager. I mean, it's like, I don't know what would have happened to me if Miss Lyons wasn't there. And so it was nice going back years later, you know, to just like, thank her, you know, to let her know that she made a huge influence on my life. And so because of that, I see teaching as a way of giving back, of like being able to be that person who cares, you know, to be the person that can help. And so that's how I kind of fell in teaching because I, I always thought, I don't want to be a teacher. I mean, my mom's a teacher, so I totally respect teachers. She teaches uh, high school Latin and middle school Latin, so <laughs> I have a lot of respect for that. But I thought, yeah, I'm not teacher material. And even though I don't see myself still, like I still feel like I'm faking it till I make it. It's like I, I want to be that helper. Um, so, uh, and then lastly, uh, how has teaching helped your professional life? And then how do you balance it? Because 
you know, teaching, you want to be able to give your most to your students, but you still, you know, have to produce the work that you want to produce as well. Well, uh, so we'll start with the, how does it make you better? Well, it immediately makes you better. Uh, teaching is, at first, when I said, like, I started to teach only really just to give back. And then I realized after a while how much I learned from teaching. And then it was like, now I'm just doing it selfishly because I get so much out of the teaching part of it. The students teach you back. Um, I think what it does for you, uh, at least for me, is it... Um, as an instructor, you have to sort of sell yourself on what you are about or what you do. It's like you have to drink your own Kool-Aid. And, uh, and when you start to do that, you have to have, you have to have answers. I mean, students are going to ask you questions. You can't just sit there like an idiot and say, well, you know, I don't know, go figure it out. You know, that's not the, the type of instructor that the, a student would want to look up to. So I always remember doing paintings and working. And always having, you know, you have sort of this idea of what you want to do and this plan. And you're sort of going, and there's always these areas where you're like, ah, I don't know what I'm going to do over here. I'll just kind of push the brush around and maybe something magical will happen. And, of course, nothing magical ever does happen. But as soon as you start teaching, then you realize at that moment, that's exactly when a student can come up and say, well, why are you doing that? And you can't really turn around and say, well, <laughs> I have no idea what I'm doing. And I'm hoping something magical will happen. That's not a good answer as an instructor. So it really makes you start to think, well, you know what, why am I doing this? What am I trying to achieve? What are, what am I, what am I going to accomplish here? And as soon as you start to do that, now you're thinking more about what you're doing. All aspects of what you do have to be thought out and have to be planned and have to have, it's not that you're always going to have a success, but you have to have a, something you're shooting for in the painting. I realize, okay, I'm going to do this. I don't know if it's going to come out, but this is what I'm doing, and this is what I'm going after. And, I, and by doing that, that's all from teaching. All that's only from the teaching part, part of it. So um, I think that that's hugely um, a, a, a benefit being an instructor. It really forces you to understand what you're about, what you want to do, uh, and it also forces you to, uh, to be a better you. You can't just wing it all the time. You can't just think I'm pretty good and just go for it. No, no, you have to have good, solid plans, good, solid ideas, and and hopefully those will turn into you know good things. And uh, what was the other part of the question? How, how do you balance your professional oh, life? I, I, I don't think that to me balancing isn't really that difficult. You know, um, you know, my instructing at the college is only one day a week, so that's not a big deal. It's only in the spring semester. Uh, and then the other ones that I teach are all workshops, and some of them are local, some of them are out of state, and you just sort of work your schedule. It's like, I know that when I go do these like four or five day workshops and everything like that, they're, they're exhausting because you throw you know, everything that you've got at it. So I can't do one and then have one the next weekend, the next weekend, the next weekend, I'll be just a pile of you know, juice on the floor. Uh, so you space them out, and I'll only do maybe, maybe a couple a year and kind of look at my schedule. And then the rest of the time is just, you know, since this is what we do, a lot of us are professional painters or professional artists. Uh, so, you're, you know, the balance just seems to be easy. You know, you're not going to take on something that's going to totally uh, take you away from doing the work that you need to do. You're going to say no to that position or job. And on the other hand, you're going to want to say, well, I need to do this here. I, this is these teaching things also keep me fresh, keep me updated. So I want to do as much. So the scheduling part for me isn't really a big deal. It seems to all work out. Uh, I'm much better with deadlines anyway. So as long as I know I have something to do, I got to get curriculum done. I got to get the classroom stuff done. I do it. I got to get this painting done and this stuff done for the festival. I do it. Uh, so unless there's something for me to do, then I'm lazy, as my wife will tell me. Um, Balancing your teaching with the rest of your life is made easier when you only teach for three consecutive days a year. <laughs> that's my that's my recommendation. Um, but even though even though it's only three days, it does pay huge dividends to my work and life. And it's a little bit what Greg was saying, and and what Dennis and I were saying to each other before we began here. Um, there's a huge benefit in teaching a class because. Each year when you begin that class anew, 
um, you go through this soul searching exercise of trying to figure out what have I learned in the past year since the last time I was putting the curriculum together? How has the world changed in the last year? What has become important enough to rise to the level where it should be included in the curriculum? And uh, that not only informs what to teach in the class, but in my case, um, so I, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm teaching all of these uh, subjects uh, through people who want to advance their careers in the law, but then I'm taking that same information back to my own law firm to prioritize the projects that are, are worth thinking about for us. And I'm using the, um, the, the communication method that, through which I discuss these subjects with my class. I'm using that same uh, language to explain the subjects to the partners in my law firm and to persuade them that these are things worth doing. So there's, there's great benefit um, to the day job. And there's even benefit to uh, life here at the festival. So, you know, one of the classes that I uh, am, am teaching at QW is about artificial intelligence, because AI plays such a huge role in the legal practice these days that the students need to know uh, how, to, how to apply it. But I found last summer that when people found out that I did legal technology work, a lot of them wanted to talk about AI, that it was a subject really interesting to them. It's obviously not something limited to the law, but we all use AI every day in a million different ways. And I was thinking it would be interesting to figure out a way to create an exhibit that would discuss AI, since so many people have an interest in it. And uh, that's how my exhibit this summer came about. Um, and, uh, and the idea that I might be able to teach something about the subject, to use my photography not as just a way to show beautiful images to people, but as an instrument um, to teach. So that's sort of what I've been doing. Uh, I'm not giving out any master's degrees at my booth, but um, you know, it's been a lot of fun, very interesting conversations with people about the subject. And, uh, and all of that, I think, came out of the future. Uh, well, how do you get along with your boss? Both of these things, educating students and then pursuing your career in art. I never even thought of it. I mean, uh, it just was so natural. For starters, as Jeff mentioned, you know, we just this is a very short period of time in the original. The thing is, we taught, I always taught, in the fall, I'd come to do the summer shows, there was no school. So it was not hard to make that jump, you know, to come here and work here and then go back to school. They were, as far as I was going to, I know they're connected, but they seemed like two different things. And so it never seemed to be a problem. It always seemed to be like it was, you know, serendipity. It was just it worked out really well that this show helped went on in the summer when I had summers off. And the way you'd use your time, I mean, during the school year, I was a devoted teacher. I, I, I think it's a good teacher. The kids enjoyed the classes. I improved enrollment. It always went up. And, you know, so that part of me was never, sh I never shorted the class in my pursuit of what I was trying to do. I never really thought of myself as an artist like, like to me, I didn't know when I was six years old that I was going to be a professional, you know, a fine art photographer and spend 20 years at this wonderful show in Laguna Beach and be an accepted member of this community. I never really thought of myself that way. I just, I was a photographer and I was just trying to learn my art. I wanted to learn how to do really good photography and then take that knowledge as much as I could transfer it to the kids. And what I found out was not only was I doing that, but I was drawing as much from them as well, just with their comments and their insights. I'd show my own work and they'd comment on it. And they'd have some, <laughs> they had critical comments on it sometimes. But it was fun to hear that. It was fun to talk to them, have that back and forth. And I was able to use it. I actually used it many times to take a look at my own work. It made me more critical of my stuff. So I find it to be really, you know, very sympathetic between the two. I, I think they go together very well. And, and, and I always have. I still do. Um. I have to say I am not so good with technology. <laughs> and so here I have a class of, you know, every semester, 25 to 30 students. And uh, they are not drawing on their sketchbooks, but on a computer pad. So they're not looking down and drawing like we normally do, but they're looking in front of them and at a computer screen. They're drawing here, but looking at a computer screen. Um, you learn so much from, from the next generation. Also, I teach them a technique. I tell them, okay, we're going, you know, you're going to do a woodcut or something. And the next thing you know, uh, they have downloaded an app 
that I didn't know existed. And they are taking their photographs and they're, you know, they're able to change colors and, you know, put their personal life into these apps and uh, use them in the art class. So I'm constantly learning from my students, which is so fun. The 18 year old mind, the 19, is just amazing how quickly they can uh, they can take what you're trying to teach and they're quite fearless you know they'll just go and jump into it and, and uh, start uh, making an image to be um, well I teach uh, three three days a week and so uh, it seems like you know it's not enough but it is it is quite a bit um, I try to be selfish when I am home, uh, to be in the studio as much as possible, but I do know sometimes I feel, start to feel tired. And um, uh, for an artist to teach and then go back to your studio and start creating, your brain is not there. I'm still thinking about their plates, their imagery, they're texting me, uh, they're what they're doing at home. They're carving their block and sending me, you know, texts. So I'm constantly thinking about their work also. <coughs> so you really need to learn. I have learned to turn that off and then turn the Vanita selfish time in the studio on um, just because, uh, you know, on top of the, the show here, I also uh, show, you know, in some galleries, um, and uh, I, you know, I travel overseas to teach in other print studios, and so it's really fun. It's fun to teach, uh, but it is difficult to manage. For me, I had to make a concentrated effort to manage the time between studio and classroom. All right, let's open it up to any questions that any of you might have. Don't be scared, we're all teachers. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> every, every bit of that. Right now, <laughs> the whole thing. You know, it's interesting, that, that thing. Oh, and could you repeat the question? What Pat was asking about this zone system invented by Ansel Adams, my hero in the world of photography. And it, it's simply a method when you use it. Like, you can actually still apply it to digital, but in the day, it was a way of exposing film for the shadows and then developing for highlights. It's a way that you can expand the range of black and white film. So when you made a black and white photograph, you'd get a full tone print from the richest blacks to the purest whites, but still have detail in almost everything. And he shot also with the, he had, was a, a member of the, six, the F64 club, which shot everything at really small aperture. So everything was razor sharp. Now we're talking mainly about landscape photography here, but he did other things. And I've found that I've done other things too, but I still apply the rules of the zone system to even the digital work I do, I still consider that when I'm doing work that they change the ISO. I mean, there's different things you can do digitally that still, but the fundamental understanding of it is it's just a, a way to control the media that you're working with. Now, I don't do black and white film anymore. I haven't for years. I had to let it go and it bothered me. I gave all my dark room equipment to Orange Coast College and now I'm shooting digital. But that was tough. That was when I quit teaching in 1999. Um, we didn't have any digital cameras at the school. There were a few kids talking about it, but we had no computers in my classroom in 1999. Nobody's texting me like they're texting Vanita. When I left class, I was gone. Yeah, I didn't hear from them until the next day. So it's a different world out there now, but still those techniques, that, that discipline that you learned from being a zone system photographer and using a tripod all the time because your camera was too big to handhold it, it made you very selective of what you chose to do made you look real hard, at least it did me, because they didn't want to waste the film, and I, I had to take it too much time, so you, you became really intense shooting, and I still shoot that way, even though I take more pictures now, I still shoot that way, because that's where I learned it, that's, like, that's the zone system, Pat. <laughs> I have to compliment that, Dennis, here. I have never heard a more succinct or effective description of the zone system than that. That's a, <laughs> that's a mark of a great teacher. Any other questions? Okay, one more. Go ahead.
You know, I, I am, am a great uh, lover and believer in technology and, uh, and think it makes a lot of things better, but, uh, but not teaching. Um, it, it's those moments uh, that Greg was talking about of being able to look a student in the eye, see the, the moment at which um, they have caught on to a concept or are struggling with a concept that can inform a little bit of follow-up or, or change the cadence of the class. And to do that you know, one student at a, at a time, uh, where if, I, if we were doing something by Skype or something and I could only see the entire group at a distance or just one person at a time, I would be missing all those subtle interactions that, that mean so much for the teaching experience. So it, you know, it, may, it may come to the world in which that's the option available to us, but I think we'll have lost a lot in translation if that happens. Question? So the question. So the question is, how would you price a workshop, or how do you figure out how much uh, it should be for the time or the? Well, I, I do a lot of those like short day, you know, because the ones I teach are out of out of state. Um, they're, they're usually anywhere from three to five days. Uh, it's if you're only here, then you can simply just look around and see what other people are charging. You have to try to find where you fit in, what you're worth, uh, but you can, can kind of compare, uh, look and see what other people are charging, look and see what they're doing, or even simply sign up and take one, and invest the money and see how, how are they doing it, are they good, they're not so good, and then you can sort of gauge yourself off of that. Um, now when I travel though, things change, you know, because when you're teaching out of state, sometimes what you would charge here makes no sense there, it's either too expensive, or sometimes you'll go to areas where they'll like everyone will sign up because it's so darn cheap. Uh, so you really have to sort of. But luckily, a lot of like the out-of-state ones, someone else is doing the, the work for me. We discuss the price. They'll tell me what they think is good, and then I'll I'll just kind of look at your numbers and sort of like, okay, I'm going to make X amount of dollars. That's that's agreeable, and that works out. Uh, but otherwise, just do your research, look around, see what people are charging, what makes sense. And then you sort of have to feel it out too, because once you sort of say, "Okay, here's my class, and it's X dollars for so many days," you know, are people clamoring to go there? Or are they looking at you like, "Are you insane? I'm not spending that money." <laughs> and you, you find your way. All right. Any more before we finish? Well, I want to thank you all for. Oh, sorry, Pat again. Go ahead. Not nearly enough. <laughs> you can ask my spouse. <laughs> well, mine's home. She said she thought she might come down, but I don't see her out here today. So I might tell you something right there. So I do thank my husband. Uh, he is 100% uh, supportive of uh, everything I do and uh, never asks, you know, uh, why did you buy this or, you know, so, uh, yes, I'm very thankful to have a permanent patron. <laughs> Maybe that's why I'm single. No. <laughs> so I do want to thank you all for attending. Um, again, thank you, PBS SoCal, for sponsoring the tea. We really appreciate it. And um, next week, the topic is going to be on portraiture. So join us next Wednesday also at 1 o'clock and come hear from those artists. So thank you again. And thank you.